Today, we gather as an online community, united by one voice, to worship and praise our Lord and Saviour. Good morning, Will. It's uh, great to be back at Highlands. And um, yeah, when uh, William sent me a message and asked me to uh, look at maybe preaching again, and uh, I was quite busy on various Sundays, so I, um, by the time I got to choose a passage, all the other passages in uh, following Jesus and in Jesus' life, had gone. So I got this one. And I thought, well, this is a very, very interesting passage because I don't know what you make of it. It's not recorded. The story is unusual in that it's not in any other of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, John, they don't mention this at all. And Although we all know that Jesus, well, I hope you all know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and Bethlehem lies about eight kilometers just to the south uh, of Jerusalem. But of course, he grew up in Nazareth, and Nazareth is about a hundred kilometers to the north of Jerusalem, I guess about the same distance as from here to Chigutu. It's about 100 kilometers away. And at Passover time, Joseph and Mary were going up to Jerusalem, a journey that probably took them about a week. And there were three main festivals in the Jewish calendar, and those were Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. And people would travel up to Jerusalem for those. And Jerusalem would swell from a city of maybe 80,000 people to a couple of hundred thousand people. Everyone would come up, everyone would come up to celebrate. I remember about 20 years ago, traveling to Johannesburg, uh, over Easter and I just thought we'll go to Johannesburg over Easter and I don't know if any of you ever have ever done that the Zion Church of South Africa has a meeting north of Johannesburg over Easter and there are probably two or three million people that travel to that celebration And you come to the first toll and you realize the lineup for the toll is maybe 10 kilometers long and you are going to be there for an hour. You try and get fuel at a fuel station. Same thing. You are in a lineup forever. And that whole area, I guess probably about... 5% or 10% of South Africa descends on that area, and it's just clogged. And that's exactly what happened with Jerusalem. There was just this vast horde of people who went up to celebrate Passover. And of course, after the Passover is over, Joseph and Mary and probably a huge contingent of people start traveling back to Nazareth. Now, we don't know exactly, you know, the Bible's a little bit sexist on occasion because we know that Jesus, there was Jesus who was the firstborn, and then there were four other sons that are named. And of course, they say, they talk about Jesus' sisters, but they are the no-name brand. We don't know any of their names. Because they use the word plural, sisters, we know there were at least two. So there were five sons and at least 
two sisters, two girls in the family. And you can just imagine this horde of people, after they've been traveling for a day, they suddenly realize that <clears throat> Jesus is not with them. I wonder how many of you parents have ever, especially if you've got lots of kids, have ever left a child at somebody else's place. I've been in quite a few situations where exactly that has happened. And you can just imagine Mary and Joseph and they, hmm, where is Jesus? He's the eldest. He's about 12 years old. He's about to have his bar mitzvah. He's, you know, at that age where he's not sure if he's a boy or a man. He's doing his own thing, and you think he's hanging out with his mates in this crowd of people, all going back to Nazareth. So you go to all his mates. You're shouting, you're asking, you're questioning. No, Jesus. He's not there. So eventually, after asking and asking, they return to Jerusalem, and after they've been searching, eventually, eventually, they find him in the temple courts. And here they see that he's with the teachers of the law, and they're discussing things, and everyone is amazed at both his questions and his answers. Hmm. And I guess, I guess you woman, you could put yourself exactly in her position. When they eventually find him, she says, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And I think there's a thing in a mother, when something like this happens, they're caught between two big emotions. They're so relieved that they found their son, but they're so angry that he's done it to them. Isn't that a fairly common phenomenon that we all face? You're absolutely, oh, thank goodness he's all right. Thank goodness nothing's happened to him. But why did you do this to us? You know, on the one hand, you want to love the child to bits, and the next thing you're sending him to is room. You know, because there are these conflicting emotions going on inside of Mary, and it's fascinating because you realize that Mary is caught in a place where she's forgotten. You think about all the things that happened to her. Jesus had been born under the fatherhood of God, not Joseph. We know the shepherds, the wise men, all the angelic beings saying, Hallelujah, the Messiah has come. But somehow in those 12 years, Mary has sort of drifted from realizing, hmm. And isn't it, isn't it interesting that she says, your father and I have been searching for you. Jesus' father wasn't Joseph. Jesus' father wasn't Joseph. This is the son of the Most High God. And somehow that has got lost. And Jesus' reply now comes and it has great implications. Why were you searching for me? I wonder if that's a good thing to say to your mother. Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house or doing my father's business. And it's so interesting because we see now that this separation of
of Jesus from his family in many ways is happening. Earlier in that, in the same place in the temple, when he was a baby, he was brought to Simeon. And Simeon promises that a sword will separate Mary's soul. And that was when he was a baby. And now it's starting to happen. Jesus is setting about his father's business. He's in his father's house. And he doesn't mean he's no longer the carpenter's son doing carpentry in Nazareth. He is the son of the Most High God. And although he's only 12 years old, things are going to be starting to happen. It'll be another 18 years before they really begin. But you can see the transformation. And although Jesus went back to Nazareth and was obedient and and he grew in wisdom and in grace and in favor with God and men. And Mary treasured these things in her heart. But you know, we need to realize that this is the start of change. And in this story, it's got a, it's got a very, it's hard to actually find what the message is here. But to me, the key message is, which I'd like to challenge yourself and myself with today, is, am I doing my father's business? Are you doing your spiritual father's business? What dominates my life? What dominates yours? In Luke chapter 14, he says, he basically says, anyone who comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And folks, those are very hard words. Because what Jesus is saying there and what he proved in this whole situation that we saw at the temple is that Whatever other loves we have on earth, they have to pale next to the love that we have for our Father. I can't speak for Vicky. But I will remember one time I was in the war zone between Sudan and actually Eritrea and Sudan. It was a war between the the southerners and the north and Sudan. And we were caught in the middle of this war zone. And I was in a vehicle that definitely had a curse on it. I don't know how, how many tires punctured. And finally, this vehicle came, just packed in completely. And we were in the middle of the war zone, miles away from anywhere. Temperature of about 47 degrees centigrade. And I realized that the battery had been cut through by the flywheel. And it had just, it was destroyed and leaked all over the place. And I was with a a young dentist and a young engineer. So I left them by the car and I took out the battery and carried this thing 
and eventually managed to get a ride about 30 kilometers into the nearest town, a place called Barentu, not knowing if I was going to get a new battery, and eventually I did manage to get a new battery. But they had just filled this battery with acid, and it was leaking acid everywhere. And I carried this battery for about two kilometers, and a battery is a heavy thing to carry. And it was spilling acid all over me as I walked. And finally, I got back to the car. I was terrified that I was leaving these other two out in the middle of the war zone at night. By the time I got to the vehicle, my jeans had just disappeared because the acid had just eaten just about my, all my jeans. And I promise you, I was dehydrated from a lack of water. My jeans were gone, and I had a headache from hell. And eventually we got the car back going and managed to continue our journey. And I have to say, I had a few arguments with God that night. Why, Lord Jesus, why am I doing this? My father, who was my physical father, who was never at all happy with my Christian faith. In fact, he really hated it. He would much rather I had been an anesthetist in Harare, driving a Merc and playing golf at Harare, Royal Harare Golf Course so he could boast about me. Instead of which, I had a headache from hell and no jeans left. And, you know, people think maybe when people like you sort of see Vicky standing up, you think, wow, Vicky's just amazing, isn't she? No, Vicky's not amazing. Vicky is about her father's business. Isn't that true, Vicky? And I had to be about my father's business. It didn't mean and it doesn't mean it's easy. Picking up a cross is not easy. Dying to yourself is not easy. But guys, it's what matters. Are we doing the Father's business? Is your focus upon yourself? I was watching, and it's well worth watching. There's an interesting documentary done about eight years ago called The Four Horsemen. Nothing to do with spiritual stuff, but it's talking about what's happened in this world economically. And these guys, they say, you, you know, the value, Voltaire said, the value of money, of paper money, always will return to its original value. Nothing. Empires collapse. Terrorism and wars come to an end. Even in the Ukraine, Ukraine it'll come to an end. But these guys say, you know, the only way you will satisfy yourself in life is by living for a greater cause. And that cause cannot be found in yourself. And we have to be saying, we are living for the cause of Jesus Christ. And that means, my friends, going about our Father's business. Since I was here two months ago, in early February, my best friend, Laurie Marks, who was a top anesthetist in this town, dropped dead of a heart attack. Laurie got married in this church years ago. And when Mike Suddens phoned me and said he's dead, I rushed to Milton Park Medical Center. 
I laid hands on Laurie as he was lying in the emergency room and I pleaded, I cried to God to raise him from the dead, but he didn't. But as I had my one hand on Laurie's forehead and holding his hand, yeah, with my hand, I just looked at Laurie and I thought, it's over. He was five years younger than me, 64, but he's gone. There's nothing more to be done. There's nothing more to be done. And thankfully, I really believe that Laurie had been about his father's business when he died. And there was a big memorial service and a cremation and lots of wonderful testimonies were given. But you know, the testimonies of men don't really matter. There was only one sentence that I pray, and I'm sure Laurie heard it, as he died. And that would be the Lord saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have run the race and your work is done. Enter into the rest prepared for you. Quite honestly, I was jealous of Laurie. He's five years younger than me. And I thought, why not me, Lord? Why not me? And I just have to trust that for some reason, he's kept me alive. Maybe to do some more work. But I keep saying, Father, only keep me alive as long as I am doing the Father's business. And guys, I just want to challenge you from this little rather strange story. I pray that you are busy about the Father's business. Are you spending time in our Father's word? Are you spending time coming here in our Father's house? And then are you going out there and setting about the Father's business? Laurie Marks got up to go and do his pre-meds at Milton Park Medical Center and an hour later was dead. No warning sign, nothing, nothing, nothing. And that could be you and it could be me. And the only way to be ready for that moment, my friends, is to be always ready. Most people don't get a chance to say, oh, okay, let's just... Go and be all spiritual and good for the next period of time. Because the bell tolls, and my friend, it may toll for you, and it may toll for me. And I can hardly wait. I can hardly wait. Because then, Lorraine, we're going to be praising the Lord, I promise you then. We are going to be praising. We are going to be praising for all eternity. There will be no more sin. We'll be working, I believe, but we will be praising the Lord. Nobody will be bringing the singing to an end. We will be doing it. And I want to just encourage you, the music group, keep on playing. You know, I think Shakespeare said, if music be the food of love, play on. And I would say, keep on, keep on, keep on praising the Lord.
But folks, I just want to finish saying, are you doing the Father's business? Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for this little story. And I pray that you will challenge me and you will challenge each person here. Are we doing the Father's business? Let's not look to others, to Vicky, and say, Vicky does the Father's business. I don't. Let's say, all of us, let us be about our Father's business in our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, so that when that moment comes, you say to each one of us, well done, my good and faithful servant, because we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that you would have a great week knowing that God your Father is with you every step of the way.